first and foremost, I want to welcome our very, very special guest, Senator Kamala Harris. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, CJ. I brought some friends of mine, Donovan Mitchell, Tobias Harris, who are big in the community. Obviously, there was a lot of stuff that occurred while we were in the bubble, and we had to figure out ways to use our platform and speak out for those who don't necessarily have a voice. So I'd like to start with Donovan Mitchell, obviously. You had an incredible playoff run, but I think what you did in terms of speaking out was, was even more impressive. So just walk us through your thought process as an athlete who tries to use his platform. You know, no voice is too little. And I think the great thing about the league that we were making a huge push to go out and vote, you know, focusing on education, finding ways to at least inform, you know, and give back to the community. My mom being a teacher and, what, and she's instilled that in me. Um, but that was really one of the biggest things for me going into the bubble was the play was going to take care of itself. Mm. But I wanted to be able to give back at knowledge. You know, I think that's really what car carries and, and goes a long way. Senator Harris. Can you kind of explain the importance of voting yes. at the upcoming election, especially uh, men of color and people of color? Yes. I mean, there's so much at stake in this election. And I think about it in about three different ways, all of which are at play. One of the last big events I did before the pandemic struck was to be in Selma, Alabama, walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with John Lewis, who is now one of the ancestors. But remember, John Lewis was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington. He was in his 20s when they walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the marshals turned on the crowd and beat them. He shed blood on that bridge. And they were marching for the right to vote and for black folks to be able to vote. So one way that I think about the importance of voting is honoring the ancestors, right? All those people who shed his blood for us to be able to vote. There is the other piece of it that is about what is at stake. Let's just look at the upcoming election. What is at stake? The United States Supreme Court. Who sits on that court matters. If it's Donald Trump versus Joe Biden making a decision about who sits on that court, it's going to have everything to do with almost every civil rights issue that you can imagine that will go before that court. And then there's another piece. In 2013, the United States Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. Right after they got rid of those protections, all these states ended up putting in place laws that were designed to prevent black folks from voting. So much so that in North Carolina, a court of appeal reviewed it and said that they wrote the law with, quote, surgical precision to prevent black folks from voting. Why do you think so many powerful people are trying to make it so difficult for us to vote? And you know what the answer is? because they know when we vote, things change. Don't let anybody take your power. That's our power. So let's not let them play us. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think one of the reasons why we're here is to have those types of conversations to, to drive education to the masses, because a lot of times people don't feel like they can create change. And on the bubble, Tobias, you talked about it, having actionable items in which we can drive change and figuring out what's near and dear to our hearts. Yeah, so, you know, for me in the bubble, with everything going on, with us trying to really bring attention to the Breonna Taylor case, and then to get the result that we did was, it made myself personally feel like we're bringing all this type of attention and we get a bad result. Like one thing I would want to know with yourself and VP Biden, mm -hmm. what are ways you may handle it differently than our president now has handled it? Because a lot of it doesn't sit well with myself, family members, and I know the African-American community who truly cares and knows that that could be their brother or sister next, you know? So, there is not a black man I know, be he a relative or a friend, who has not had some experience with police, which has been about an unreasonable stop, some kind of profiling or excessive force. So it starts with having leadership that speaks the truth about the fact of it. We don't have that in the White House right now, but it matters who's in a position of leadership and, and how they use the mic that's in front of them. And part of this on the issue of police brutality is about speaking the truth of it and then doing something about it. You know, I was the first, I think, national elected leader to speak out about Breonna Taylor. And there are so many Breonnas and George Floyd's. We all know that, right? I mean, one of the things that has made this issue 
now much more in the public sphere is because of smartphones. So now people are seeing what we've been knowing forever, but maybe didn't have witnesses. So having leadership that speaks the truth about it, and then what do we do in terms of reform? So for example, we're saying there needs to be a ban on chokeholds and carotid holes across the board. Let's have a national registry of police officers who break the law. Why? Well, because in a lot of cases, those cases don't go to court. It's an administrative hearing. The person might get fired. They just have to move to a new ju jurisdiction. Their record doesn't follow them, and then you know what happens. So these are the kinds of things that we have to put in place. There needs to be consequence and accountability. It's, this phrase is used all the time, and almost every time it is used, it is directed at the person who was arrested and not at the system itself and the players in the system. And that's the problem. I agree, and I think looking at where we're at currently in society with, with COVID-19, us having to sit here six feet away, yell at each other with masks on, <laughs> it's impacted everything. Looking at the current administration and their lack of belief in science. As a person who's big on education, Donovan, you grew up uh, in a household in which your mother was a teacher. How has COVID affected the educational systems and what that means for our future leaders who are trying to learn via Zoom? So. You know, I went to private school um, and public school. So I've seen the two different Americas in this world. And it's crazy. There are some friends that I went to private school with that have no idea what's happening 45 minutes away in the projects, in certain areas. No idea how people live yeah. and vice versa. That's right. So for me, understanding and having my mom and talking to her about it, I was just like, how can we continue to find ways to, to push education? You know, because I'm, I'm 24 and there are people who are way older than me that don't even know what Juneteenth is. I know. Or Black Wall Street. I know. You know, and I'm informing I them. And I always wonder, you know, if we want to get to the ultimate goal of equality, you know, whether it's through education or systemic racism or voter suppression, whatever it is, the best thing we can do is inform. There's no way a kid in the Bronx shouldn't receive the same education because of where he goes to school as That's a kid right. in, in Connecticut. What is the Biden-Harris plan, you know, mm. to 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 help that because now with COVID going on, we don't give our teachers enough credit because it's one thing to teach the students, but it's the quality of education and where it's coming from and the mouths that it's coming from. And absolutely right. that was one of the questions I have for you. That's absolutely right. You have raised what I think is one of the most important issues that we need to address immediately. I do believe that teachers do God's work. I mean, it's a gift. It's a skill and it's a gift to give your life to educate other people's children. And to your point, 94% of our public school teachers come out of their own pocket to help pay for school supplies. And we don't pay them enough. Teachers are, in fact, interestingly, and I'm half joking, what COVID has done now that everybody has to teach their kids at home, they're learning that we're not paying teachers enough because <laughs> they're now figuring out what is required all day long to actually educate a child, and it's a lot. And part of what the problem is, is that we fund public schools based on the tax base of that community. Well, that's completely upside down. That doesn't make any sense, because that means the, the schools that are getting the lowest amount of funding, we know are in the communities that have the highest need. So part of what we're gonna do also is it's called Title I funding. It's basically the funding that goes to low-income schools, we're gonna triple it. And also, we need to address undiagnosed and untreated trauma. Poverty is trauma-inducing. Going to sleep every night and hearing gunfire is trauma-inducing. Having attended a funeral for some relative or neighbor who was under the age of 25 and a black man who died because of a gunshot is trauma-inducing. And so what ends up happening with anybody that has experienced trauma? We know, we call it PTSD. We recognize it in people who go to war. If you've not addressed the trauma, that child cannot go to the school the next day and, and take full capacity of what is there. So that's why I say that it's really important to include in our push for more funding for public education, that piece of it that's about counselors in schools and all of the support so that your mother can teach and other people can help the child. And also, we need to have a president and leadership in the White House that knows if a black child has a black teacher, 
by the end of third grade, they're 13% more likely to go to college. And I am living proof of that. Thank God for Mrs. Frances Wilson. May she rest in peace, who was my first grade teacher and attended my law school graduation. No, I appreciate you kind of breaking <laughs> that down and explaining it, because I, I work with a lot of the Boys and Girls Clubs. And one of the things I'm big on is teaching you know, young black and brown kids coding, right? Yes. A lot yes. of kids don't understand the importance of coding and how necessary it is yes. across the world. And I think you've done a great job of touching on actionable items in which we can do collectively, in which some of our listeners can do. But I think what we want to know collectively, what does Remaking America look like with your ticket? Um, a lot of how I think about it is investing in the health of America. You go to any upper middle class suburb in America, you will not see the kind of police presence that you'll see in other communities. But what you will see, well-funded public schools, high rates of home ownership, access to capital for small businesses, affordable health care and affordable mental health care. Healthy communities are safe communities. So part of how Joe and I think about it is we got to invest in the health of all communities, and but we do it in a way that is about not only equality, but equity. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests, oh, everyone should get the same amount. The problem with that, not everybody's starting out from the same place. So if we're all getting the same amount, but you started out back there and I started out over here, we could get the same amount, but you're still gonna be that far back behind me. Equitable treatment means we all end up at the same place. And so that's why we talk about the money going to HBCUs. The um, $150 billion is going to go into low interest loans for small businesses and with a target on minority owned businesses. And with a target also to community banks, which know the folks in the neighborhood, so that we can make sure that all of that talent, you know, we do not lack for innovation. We got all kinds of ideas, right? We are creative but don't have access to capital. So that's a big part of the plan too. Again, investing in the health and well-being of the community. Those are some of the things, but it really is about investing in people and knowing the capacity and seeing the capacity, but knowing that if you don't put the resources into it, it will not achieve what, what it can achieve and what we must encourage it to achieve. I just want to say thank you and um, looking forward to um, seeing the change. I think that's why we're here. That's why, that's why you're here. Looking forward to be a part of history. I appreciate you not only coming here, but, but sharing so much on impactful ways we can all drive change. We've all tried to use our voices collectively. As African-American men, we feel like we have a responsibility. I just want to encourage people to, to continue to go out and vote. I think that's big. And the election is coming soon, and we have a chance to, to help drive and make real change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you.